one of the greatest, uh, most mysterious happenings in our life of faith, in the life of faith, uh, in the history of the world, of course, is the very coming of Jesus into the world. And, you know, we, we, we take it for granted. Uh, Advent comes, Christmas, we celebrate the birth of Christ. But if you think about it, this is so enormous, this is so astounding, this is so uh, mysterious that God himself came down and became man. And of course, we would not be here if not for the coming of Christ. Uh, we would not be Christians. Uh, we would not have this kind of life. We are Christians precisely because Jesus, the Son of God, came into the world, became man, suffered and died for us, uh, rose from the dead, and won for us our salvation. So we look at various passages where Jesus tells us why he came. And of course, in general, we know. And basically, it is to be the savior of the world. But there are more specifics to that that round it out, that, that fill up uh, the fullness of our understanding of this very important, uh, mind-boggling event in the life of the world, in, in the history of the world. Jesus says in John 16, verse 28, I came from the Father and have come into the world. Now I am leaving the world and going back to the Father. So it's God, our Father, who sent his own son, Jesus. He came into the world. He did his public ministry. Of course, he, uh, he grew up. You know, and when he was about uh, 30 years old, he did a short few years of public ministry. Uh, and then... After he rose from the dead, uh, he appeared to many different people and finally uh, ascended into heaven, back, back to the Father. So he says, I'm leaving the world and going back to the Father. But in that time that he was here, especially in uh, the less than three years of his public ministry, he accomplished what the Father had sent him to do. And, and uh, he won for us our salvation, our uh, redemption. But that salvation needs to be proclaimed. Because there are many people that Jesus was not able to reach. They didn't hear him preach and teach. And uh, so he left this task. He went back to the Father. He left this task to his disciples. And he told them, you go. You do the very work that I did. And this is the work that we have today. It is divine work. It is the very work of, of God. Oh. And he says, I'm leaving the world, but I'm leaving you to continue the work. I return to the Father. I will be back once again, the second coming of Jesus. But until that time, you, my people, you go and do uh, the work. And so it is important for us to understand a little bit uh, deeper why Jesus came. And I will look at eight passages uh, where he came for some specific purpose. So the very first one, Jesus came in order to bring abundant life. John 10 verse 10. I came so that they might have life and have it more abundantly. And this is so important. God is the author of life. Uh, God gives life, takes away life. We owe our life to God. If not for God, uh, we, would not, we would not have life. But Jesus says, I came, not only that we would have life, but have it more abundantly. The, the desire of God for his creation is abundant life. That's that's why when we are, are here, we're in darkness, we're in the midst of sin, the tsunami of evil, 
and we're experiencing lockdown uh, under quarantine with this pandemic and all the wrong things that are happening, the wars that is that are out there in the world, uh, and and many people are, are are hungry, are poor, are so much in need. This is not the intent of God. God created a world of abundance, and we are to partake of that world. And what wrong is happening, what darkness is happening, is simply because of the sinfulness of humanity. But if you talk about God, Jesus coming into the world, desiring to bring us abundant life. And, and of course, that starts with revealing himself and the Father to everyone, uh, and then doing the things that he did and uh, the teachings that they gave, uh, and finally going to the cross to win for us our salvation. Now, this passage, John 10, verse 10, uh, we read it in, in John 10, first of all, before that, Jesus talks about being the, the gate for the sheep. And then after this passage, he talks about, and, and he talks about being uh, the, the good shepherd. So this is all about God taking care of his people, the, the sheep of the, uh, of, of the flock, you know, God's own flock. Remember one time when uh, Jesus was starting his public ministry? Uh, we read in Matthew 9, verse 36, where uh, he, he, he looked at the people, and they were like sheep without a shepherd. And his heart was moved with pity. Because that is not God's intent. That is now not how it should be. We are the sheep of the sheepfold. We are God's people. And God and Jesus, the chief shepherd, uh, is committed to, to take care of, of, of us. And you know, the imagery of sheep is very appropriate because the, the sheep are basically helpless without the shepherd. First of all, they're subject to all kinds of predators, uh, wolves, lions, uh, uh, those that would kill them and maim them. Then they really need to be cared for, unlike other animals that can basically take care of themselves, but, but sheep need to be fed, be, need to be led to, to, to water, uh, need to be uh, brought to, to pasture, uh, and, and if they have, they have uh, wounds or illnesses, need to be uh, really, really cared for. And the sheep are docile to the shepherd. They know the very voice of the shepherd. They follow the shepherd wherever the shepherd uh, brings them. So that's what we are. We, we are sheep in relation to, to God, and more particularly Jesus, who is the good shepherd. When Jesus talks about being the gate of the sheepfold and being the good shepherd, he's talking about protection. That he is there to protect us. That he is there to, to care for us. That the, the pasture is there. I mean, the, the sheep will not just find it. They might have to go a little bit of a distance from the, the sheepfold uh, to find pasture, to find the grass uh, that is uh, good for, for, for them. And much more than just caring for the sheep, the shepherd, the good shepherd, lays down his life for his sheep. And that says it all. And, and uh, you know, there, there are many of us who would care for others, maybe family members, loved ones, uh, friends, but perhaps would stop short of giving our very life, offering our very life. But the good shepherd does precisely the reason for his existence and his care is total care. You know, everything, including one's own life. So we ought to be able to look to not just life, but abundant life. Unfortunately, again, today, uh, people and the people of God are not experiencing this. And why is that? Well, of course, many wrong things that's happening in the world, much evil, many bad people out there, but also basically because we are not looking to the shepherd. Because no matter what's happening out there, remember when you talk of uh, uh, the, the, the sheep, there are predators. When you talk of the good shepherd, there are 
those that they have to be, that the sheep have to be protected from. So they are out there. That is the world. But the reason we're not experiencing the fullness, the abundant life, is because we're not fully looking to the, the shepherd. And many Christians have actually left the protection of the sheepfold away from the protection of the shepherd. And so they're there, subject to the predators. But again, Jesus came so that we might have new life, so that we might be protected, so that we might be delivered from sin and Satan, so that we might be uh, restored to our fellowship with, with God. And so when we talk of Christ as the good shepherd, we're talking of the fullness of, of life, the, the abundance. We're talking of a, a life of, of peace, of, of love, of, of joy, of fulfillment, of contentment. Uh, all the goodness that God intends for his people. And in our work for the kingdom, we uh, would also experience as part of the fullness of life, the power that comes from the spirit of God and the fruitfulness that is already reserved to God's holy people. So how can we experience this new life? We go to the second reason why Jesus came, uh, and he came to call sinners. In Matthew, Mark 2, verse 17, he said, I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. In other translations, it says, I came for the, the sinners. You know? So, we do need to be reconciled with God. We are those sinners. And, and uh, we were born with original sin, cleansed by sacrament of baptism, but we still have that flesh in us, that uh, fallen nature that uh, many, we have very many people uh, fall into, into sin. So we need to be reconciled with, with God because all have sinned. Paul tells us about this in Romans 3, verse 23, where it says, uh, all have sinned and are deprived of the glory of God. So notice that. You have sinned. You are deprived of the glory of God. So what does God intend? A life of abundance where we experience the very glory of God in our lives. But because we have sinned, we are deprived of the glory of, of God. And so... God sent his very own son, Jesus, out of uh, love for us. And uh, you're familiar with that uh, most important passage in the, in the Bible, John 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that everyone who believes in him might not perish, but might have eternal life. So how do we have eternal life? Now, when you talk of eternal life, that's the fullness when you're ready into eternal life, when you're ready into heaven, that's the fullness. There's nothing lacking in that life. Now, while we're still here, uh, then we don't have that, that fullness, but we're moving towards that. But how do we have that eternal life? We believe in Jesus. We put our faith in, in him. And we don't perish due to our uh, sins. So, the response, as we all know, to the call to put our faith in Jesus is repentance and faith. In fact, at the very start of his mission, as recorded in the uh, Gospel of Mark, in 115, Jesus said, this is the time of fulfillment. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. The kingdom of God, the glory of God, the abundant life. So all of this are, are one package. No. It is about God and who God is and what God intends for, for his people. And Jesus says, okay, now I'm here. Now is the time of fulfillment. The kingdom of God is at hand. How do you access the kingdom of God? Repent. Turn away from sin. Experience conversion. Be transformed. Turn to faith in Jesus. Now today, very many, including those who are Christians or claim to be Christians, do not truly know about the, the saving work of Jesus. I mean, they don't truly know. 
they don't really grasp or understand. Uh, yes, they might have heard from before, Jesus is a Savior, save us from our sins, uh, forgive us, uh, restore us to the Father. But they do not really know how, how tremendous, how, how astounding, how wonderful the saving act of Jesus is. Because if they only knew, they would act. They would have to act. They would have to respond. If they only knew what Jesus did for them, what God, first of all, intended for his people. That's why he sent his very own son. But then if they only knew what Jesus did for them, this God who became man, this, this uh, savior of the world, going to the cross, we cannot not respond. We, we need to respond. We need to, we need to act. God became man and offered this very life for our sins. How can we not respond to such great love? So those who do not know, they don't respond in that way. Uh, then there are those who do know. Perhaps they have a better understanding, but they might not act accordingly. How can we say they're not acting accordingly? When they continue in sin. That's why you and I, because we continue to sin, we all fail. Hopefully not to a grave extent, but we, we all do fail. But uh, those who continue to sin are not acting in accordance with this profound knowledge and realization of what Jesus has already done for us. When we sin, we continue to nail Jesus to the cross. How can we do that? How can, you know, if, if you, 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 you fall, you fall into, into sin, why? Because it's pleasurable and okay, uh, you know, uh, in my weakness, fall into sin. But if what you were actually doing was physically nailing the, the, the palm, the hand of Jesus to the cross, you would think twice, you would think three times, you would never do that. So if we truly understood what sin is all about and what the, the, the saving act of Jesus was all about, it would radically change our, our lives. We would repent and turn to faith in Jesus. That's why it's also all, all so, so important to gaze every now and then at the crucifix. Certainly, when you pray the rosary, you gaze. You don't just hold that rosary in the palm of your hand, but you gaze at the crucifix. You, you kiss the crucifix. In, in your home, you should have the crucifix in, in various parts of your home so that you're there at the uh, dining room or in the, the bedroom or the recreation room or wherever that might be, and you, you, you glance and there. There is Jesus hanging on the cross. We need to be conscious and appreciative of what God has actually done, done uh, for us. Unfortunately, again today, there are even some in the church who degrade the reality of Jesus as the only Savior. Remember, God became man, went to the cross, a horrible instrument of suffering and death but then and, and became our savior one for us our salvation but then there are christians who degrade the reality of jesus as the savior the only savior because there, there are those who who look to other religions as ways to the divine how can that be can you find salvation in any other religion? Hinduism, Islam, Buddhism, Confucianism? Uh, you cannot. There is only one Savior. Jesus himself said so. In, in John 14, verse uh, 6, Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. No one. 
not through the founders of other religions, not through uh, other great uh, philosophers or prophets, only through Jesus. And then Peter expounded on this. He said in Acts 4 verse 12, there is no salvation. There is no salvation through anyone else, nor is there any other name under heaven given to the human race by which we are to be saved. No salvation in anyone else, no other name by which we are to be saved. The other founders of the religions never said, I am your salvation. I am your savior. It is I who saved you. None of them ever said that. Only Jesus has made that claim. And it is the only reality. Now we're talking of, of, of sin. Uh, we know that uh, only God can forgive sin. None of the other gods with a small g or, or great religious leaders uh, or prophets, none of them could forgive sin. Only God can forgive sin. Now, you, you, you know that, that incident of uh, uh, Jesus was uh, uh, healing of the paralytic and he was a company of the, 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 the Jews and uh, he, he told the paralytic, uh, your sins are forgiven. And the Jews started murmuring. And, and this is what they said in, in Mark 2 verse uh, 7. Uh, the scribe said, who but God alone can forgive sins? Okay. So Jesus said, your sins are forgiven. So they were saying, only God can forgive sins, not you. Jesus, you're just a man. Only God can forgive sins. So Jesus, of course, was aware of what they were saying. And later on in verses 9 to 12, he says, which is easier? To say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise, pick up your mat, and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority to forgive sins on earth, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your mat, and go home. He rose, picked up his mat at once, and went away in the sight of everyone. And everyone was astounded. And, and what, 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 what was Jesus actually uh, saying here? He said what is easier, to say your sins are forgiven? That's so easy. I can say that. I can say that to you right now. You want me to forgive your sins? Your sins are forgiven. But are your sins forgiven? No, they're not because I cannot forgive sins. Only God can forgive sins. But it is easy to say. And, and no one will, will ever know. Uh, is there... Is there uh, do the angels sing hallelujah? Uh, your sins are forgiven because someone said uh, your sins are forgiven. No, we never know. So Jesus said, what is easier to say your sins are forgiven or to say to this paralytic who does not walk, rise, pick up your mat and walk. And so Jesus said, just so you will know that I can forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, rise, pick up your mat and walk. And that's what the paralytic did. And people were astounded. So Jesus came to call sinners. And, and our action, our response uh, is to repent of sin. Is to ask forgiveness from God. And we are assured in 1 John 1 verse 9, if we acknowledge our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from every wrongdoing. That's God's assurance. You know, when you when you do wrong to someone and you say, I'm sorry, or please forgive me, well, you're not sure the, the person might not forgive you. Oh, you know, you did such a bad thing. You know, uh, I need to remain angry with you for, for a while. Maybe I'll forgive you later on. But that's with God. If we acknowledge our sins, if we are truly repentant, uh, then God will forgive our sins. We, we, we can rely on that and cleanse us from any wrongdoing. So that's the important thing, that we are cleansed of our 
sin. Okay. Having been reconciled with God, we start to live a new life in Christ. And it is a life, one way to describe that, it, it is a life that is lived in the light. And that's very appropriate because when we're in sin, apart from Christ, we are in darkness. But when we accept Christ, when we repent of sin, when we start to live our lives in Him and for Him, then it is a life lived in the light. So uh, the third thing that Jesus came to do was to bring light. He says in John 12, verse 46, I came into the world as light so that everyone who believes in me might not remain in darkness. You know, the, the prophet Isaiah foretold this uh, long, long ago. Uh, he said in Isaiah 9, verse 1, uh, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Upon those who live in a land of gloom, a light has shone. So it's like, it's like today. We, we are a people who are walking in darkness and we're living in a land of gloom, you know, doom and, and gloom. And uh, it was the same way with the people of God at that time. And Isaiah prophesied. They have seen a great light. And of course, we know that that is fulfilled in Jesus. And Jesus himself says in John 8 verse 12, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Now see how important this is. It is moving from darkness to light. And, and, and you know, that, that, that is such a contrast. In fact, uh, in, in darkness, uh, you cannot see. If, if, if it's dark, don't have a flashlight. Uh, you, you cannot see. When you're walking, you might stumble. You might trip and, and fall. Uh, when it's dark, uh, you don't see the, the larger perspective. No, because, because everything is just dark. You don't know uh, where you, you, you are. Uh, what are the, the things uh, all around you? And of course, predators prefer to lurk in the shadows. When, when it is darkness, it is not necessarily safe. There might be predators that are, that are out there. But you see what happens at dawn. Darkness breaks. The light breaks uh, the darkness at, at dawn. And suddenly, you can see. You can see all around you. Up, down, front, back, sideways. Uh, the darkness has been overcome. You, uh, you see what is all around you. You have a larger perspective. You have a, a wider and farther vision. This is what light brings. And of course, we know that in particular for us, every new, new day brings new hope. You know, we, we again live in a valley of tears and you might have had a terrible day, you know, but at night you, you, you sleep, you sleep in the peace of Christ. And when the dawn breaks, it is a new day. It is a new opportunity. It is a new uh, uh, way by which God can bring you out of your doldrums of your of your uh, misery there will is always new hope in every new day because the light has dispelled the darkness so what does it mean to to live in the light uh, four things that i want to bring up uh, at this point to live in the light is uh, first of all to live uh, honorably live honorably with honor. Romans 13 verses 12 to 14 says, Let us then throw off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us conduct ourselves properly as in the day, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in promiscuity and licentiousness, not in rivalry and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the desires of the flesh. So, how do you live honorably? Well, there 
are there many ways why we you say that but these things there you know, we conduct ourselves properly we're in the light when when in the darkness you you do sneaky things no one will ever know, you know uh, I'm going to 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 do this sin and no one will see me because it's dark but when it's right you conduct yourselves properly not orgies not drunkenness not promiscuity not licentiousness not rivalry jealousy so all of these things are are desires of the flesh are acts of the flesh but we live in Christ we live in the spirit we live differently we live with honor as the people of God secondly to live in the light means to to live as children of light Ephesians 5 verse 8 for you were once darkness but now you are light in the Lord live as children of light so once darkness now light so live according to that light live as children of light and then it goes on in the next verse the the, the fruit of that verse 9 for light produces every kind of goodness and righteousness and truth oh huh. darkness sin evil but but light goodness righteousness truth you are children of the light live according to that light so how well we 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 go on to the next two verses verses 10 to 11 try to learn what is pleasing to the lord take no part in the fruitless works of darkness rather expose them so it's a choice you live for the lord you live for the flesh or for the 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 evil one you live for god you live or you live for mammon so it is your choice but if you live in the light you don't partake of the fruitless works of darkness in fact you expose them how else uh, in verses 15 to 20 just uh, some aspects of that watch carefully then how you live not as foolish persons but as wise do not continue in ignorance but try to understand what is the will of the lord be filled with the spirit giving thanks always and for everything in the name of our lord jesus christ to god the father so those are just a few points but you can see how great a difference it is from someone who lives in sin who lives in in darkness don't be foolish don't follow the ways of the world be wise look to the wisdom of god do not be ignorant know what is the will of god be filled with the spirit and be grateful always grateful because god is such a good god who favors us who cares for us who provides for what we need who protects us who gives us life and gives us uh, abundant life so live as children of light thirdly what does it mean to live in the light love the brethren we read in 1 john 2 verses 9 to 11 whoever says he is in the light yet hates his brother is still in the darkness whoever loves his brother remains in the light and there is nothing in him to cause a fall remember if you're in darkness you fall whoever hates his brother is in darkness he walks in darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes so if you live in the light you need to love your brothers and sisters in Christ. You are all children of God. You are all brothers and sisters of the Lord Jesus. You are part of the one body. For those of, our, who, of us who are parents, how do we look on our children? You know, when, when they're fighting, we're, we're dismayed. Uh -huh. And how we would want uh, just to see them uh, playing uh, happily, caring for one another, not hurting one another, loving each other, and that's what we would like to see it's the same thing with god in christ we become children of god and so brothers and sisters in the lord and 
God loves us, we love God, but we are to love one another as well. Unfortunately, that doesn't always happen. And in fact, there are those who, as it says here, uh, hates their brother or sister. But, but uh, uh, John says, if that is the case, you are still in darkness. And so strive to really love your brothers and sisters in the Lord. If you are called to love your enemies, how much more your brothers and sisters in the Lord. Now, brothers and sisters is very crucial, especially when you talk of church, the one body of Christ, but also in particular certain groups or Christian communities such as ours, we need to love one another. It doesn't mean to say there will not be any disagreements or differences uh, at times that uh, uh, would seem to lead to conflict, but we have our ways of resolving. And we resolve precisely because we love one another. It is not, okay, let's resolve our conflict first and then I will love you. No, I love you as my brothers and sisters in Christ. And so we have this uh, difficulty, let us resolve this conflict. That is so important because uh, the, the, the body, the particular body of Christ is the way God uh, pours out his gifts upon his people and they put all of these gifts together they move forward as one body and they're effective in that work. But if there is uh, dissension, factions, uh, jealousy, uh, bickering, uh, conflicts, uh, it, it weakens the, the body. Oh, so love the brethren. The fourth thing, what it means to live in the light, is to look to the second coming of Jesus. We read in 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 2 to 6. For you yourselves know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief at night. When people are saying peace and security, then sudden disaster comes upon them, like labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you, brothers, are not in darkness for that day to overtake you like a thief. For all of you are children of the light and children of the day. We are not of the night or of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as the rest do, but let us stay alert and sober. Now remember, we're talking of uh, Jesus bringing life, abundant life. But the fullness of that, the, the total abundance is in the afterlife, in heaven. And in the meantime, we're in this valley of tears. We're, we're uh, trying to make it through. And the greatest tragedy is if we don't make it actually to our eternal reward. And so in our life today, we need to be mindful that the Lord will come. Or before the Lord comes, we might die. And there will come uh, judgment. And we, we need to be prepared because we do not know when the time will come. It comes like a, a thief in the, in the night. So we, we're not asleep. We're not in darkness. We're not continuing in sin. But we are mindful. I need to prepare. Be prepared always. Right now, today. If you commit sin, repent immediately. And, and uh, that is what it means to, to live in, in the light. You live according to the ways of God, shunning whatever the ways of darkness of the evil one, and you are mindful that judgment day will come. And it is not something to be afraid of. It is something to look forward to. That is ultimately where uh, the abundance of life fully is. Okay. So Jesus is going to bring light, and, and light dispels darkness. And when light dispels the darkness, what it does is it, it exposes the lies of the enemy. You know, when the enemy lies, it's, 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 it's under the shadows. Yeah, it's in darkness. Uh, it's, it's away from, from uh, everyone. You know? uh, so... When we talk of lies, the, the opposite of, of that is the truth. So to live in the light is to know the truth and to live the truth. So the, the fourth thing that Jesus came to
to uh, came for was to testify to the truth. In John 18, verse 37, for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Of course, we know that Jesus is the truth. He is the way, the truth, and the light. And on the other hand, Satan is the father of lies. There is the contrast. Grace and sin. Light and darkness. Good and bad. Uh, truth and lies. Total contrast. And, and we read in 1 John 2, verse 21, Every lie is alien to the truth. There's no such thing as a lie that is true or a truth that is uh, a lie. The two are, are opposites. And one is of God and one the other of the uh, evil one. But again, unfortunately, many Christians today, people of God, those who have accepted Christ, who have been uh, baptized. Many Christians today live according to the lies of the enemy. Well, you know, it started from the very start of creation uh, with Eve and then uh, ultimately Adam, where the serpent lied to, to Eve and, and said, you know, you, you will not die if you eat of the forbidden fruit. In, in fact, you can be like, like gods. And so that those were outright uh, lies. But Eve fell, Adam fell as well, and paradise was lost. Now, unfortunately, today, today, uh, many Christians still live the lies of the enemy. For example, there are so very, very many examples, but some uh, egregious examples today. Abortion is health care. Christians are saying that. Some clerics are saying that. Abortion is health care. Abortion that murders the unborn child in the womb of the, the mother is supposed to be health care. It's, 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 a, it's a blatant lie thrown in your face and to add insult to injury saying, this is the truth. It's health care. It's something good. Something evil has become something good. What else? There are Christians who say that uh, one who is gay uh, was made by God that way. That is a lie. God does not make anyone homosexual. There are only two sexes that God created, male and female. And, and uh, well, because of uh, uh, social constructs and, and especially today how... Uh, uh, social media are influencing young minds and many people are being raised to start out with gender dysphoria and then just going to that because they are affirmed by, by the culture around them. Uh, but so there, might, there will be, there are uh, those who are homosexuals, meaning to say their attraction is to the same uh, sex, but God did not make them that way. That is the lie. God made them male and female. And the natural attraction is a man with a woman and a woman with a man. That is uh, uh, the natural thing that God placed in place there. What else? Well, the culture of death. There are those who say that contraception, divorce, euthanasia are acceptable. We're talking of Christians. And so many Catholic women use contraceptives. So many Catholic marriages have fallen apart, even though there is no uh, legal uh, divorce in, in, in the church. But they have divorced through, through, through other means, through civil means. And then what is being more and more promoted today? Euthanasia. And all of these are contrary to the will of God, to the ways of God. All of these are, are sinful, but they are today very much acceptable. 
What else are among the lies of the enemy? Again, there are very many, but let me just throw in one more. Uh, when, when people, including Christians, say uh, that the world is going to end soon due to climate change. No such thing. Climate does change. There will be extremes in the history of uh, humankind. Uh, very uh, cold spells, uh, very warm spells, global warming, global cooling. There will be ups and downs. So climate does change. But there are many who say, well, in 10 years time, in 20 years time, uh, we'll have no more food. Uh, all the snow will be, all, all the ice will be melted, uh, and so on and so forth. That's just climate change hysteria, alarmism. There is no basis uh, to it. It is not according to the truth, including scientific truth. It is not. So, don't, don't believe in the lies of the enemy. Uh, though, unfortunately, at times today, it is difficult because it's coming from Christians and even from uh, ordained ministers within the, the church. But, you know, we, we uh, are people of uh, uh, the light and of the truth. Jesus came to, to testify to the truth. That's what we live out. So, what does it mean to live the truth uh, today? Well, any day. And I want to take five points from the first letter of John. Looking into this, that's all over the New Testament, but we take a look at the first letter of John. What does it mean to live the, the truth? First of all, it means to live out our faith in uh, Jesus. 1 John 1 verse 6, If we say we have fellowship with him, while we continue to walk in darkness, we lie and do not act. In truth. Oh, so that's a very telling uh, statement. We say we're Christians. We have fellowship with God. We love God. You know? we, we follow Jesus. But then we continue to walk in darkness. And there are so many Christians that are walking in darkness. Lapsed Christians. You know? and, and so when they do that, they lie. They are not acting in truth. They are not living out their faith in Jesus. We need to live out our faith in Jesus. Secondly, what does it mean to live the truth? We acknowledge our sinfulness. That we are sinful people. And we are in need of God's uh, mercy and forgiveness. Uh, we read in 1 John 1 verses 8 to 10. If we say we are without sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. If we acknowledge our sins... He is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from every wrongdoing. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So we admit that we are sinners. In fact, it is essential. If we are to experience forgiveness of God, uh, mercy from God, it is essential that we admit that we are sinners. And again, unfortunately, in, 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 in uh, the world today, including among uh, uh, clerics, what, what they teach is uh, they no longer admit this. Someone who is in uh, active homosexual relationship, they, they, they say it's fine. Anyway, they love each other. They're not speaking the, the, the truth. So those people are now saying, oh, we have not sinned. The, the priest just accepts us, embraces us, does not talk, say, tell us that we are in sin. And so we are not. And, and this is what we, we need to understand. The truth is not in you. You deceive uh, yourselves. But if we acknowledge our sins, then our sins will be forgiven. And that's why we always say when you talk of political correctness, just accept the, uh, the sinner and embrace the sinner, uh, accompany uh, the sinner, and that's fine. We should do that. But you need to talk about the sin. Otherwise, it is false mercy. Because the sinner is now confirmed in his sin and will never get out of the sin because he's just been uh, accepted, even given Holy Communion. Why should he get out? You know? uh, the, he doesn't accept that it is a sin. The priest says it's not a sin. So, so this is, this is uh, uh, terrible you know? uh, when these things happen. 
we personally acknowledge our sins, but also as far as the sins of others, we speak out when we are clearly seeing that and say that is a sin. Today, the big uh, thing in the uh, German church is that there are so many priests uh, abetted by their bishops who are blessing same-sex unions. Because the, the, the Vatican came out saying, uh, you cannot bless same-sex unions. Why? For the simple reason that you cannot bless evil. Same-sex unions, same-sex relationships, actions are evil. They cannot be blessed. But 450 priests in Austria, 300 priests in, in uh, Germany, uh, and some other places in Europe and, uh, and in the U.S. and others as well, uh, but particularly in Germany, they said, no, we, we disagree with that. And so what we're going to do, we're going to have the celebration, we're going to bless same-sex unions. That is what that falls under here. You're saying that these people are without sin. They are in sin. And when you bless them, oh, the priest blessed our uh, same-sex uh, uh, union. So there's nothing wrong with it. It's the priest, it's the church. You are ter doing a terrible disservice. And yours is the greater sin. And I tell you, brothers and sisters in MFC, call them out. If you have a priest friend, your pastor, uh, who would actually go out and bless same-sex uh, unions, you call them out. You say that is wrong. You are in sin. You are abetting sin. You are giving uh, false mercy. And what you're doing is evil. Okay, so uh, we, we acknowledge our sinfulness. What else does it mean to live the truth? Thirdly, we keep God's commandments. Uh, 1 John 2 verse 4. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Oh, there are so many people who violate the commandments all of the time. And again, unfortunately, now the commandments of God, uh, thou shalt not kill, uh, but abortion is okay, according to, to some people in the church. Thou shalt not uh, covet your neighbor's wife, but uh, infidelity is, is acceptable to many. many there, there are many Catholics who uh, are unfaithful to their spouses. And, and all of these things. If you don't keep the commandments, you are a liar. The truth is not uh, in you. So keep the commandments. Know the commandments, first of all, and then observe them. What else? What does it mean to live the truth? Fourth, accept Jesus as Savior and Lord. 1 John 2, verses 22 to 23. Who is the liar? Whoever denies that Jesus is the Christ. Whoever denies the Father and the Son, this is the Antichrist. No one who denies the Son has the Father. But whoever confesses the Son has the Father as well. So, so, uh, Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is the uh, Messiah. Uh, Jesus is our Savior, our, our Redeemer. He's our Lord. He's our, he our Master. He's the Chosen One. And we don't deny Him. We embrace Him. We accept Him. We live out His prescriptions for our lives. We live our lives uh, for Him. We never turn away from Him. Even in the face of persecution, oppression, martyrdom, for many of them come before us, us, we don't deny him. We don't turn away from him. Otherwise, we uh, are, are uh, liars and we deny the truth. What else? Finally, a fifth thing. Uh, what does it mean to live the truth? It is to love our brethren. So there we, we have it again, loving our brethren. Uh, 1 John 4, verses 20 to 21. If anyone says, I love God, but hates his brother, he is a liar. For whoever does not love a brother whom he has seen, 
cannot love God whom he has not seen. This is a commandment we have from him. Whoever loves God must also love his brother. And this is a challenge to us. At times we might justify it, oh, this brother is so hard to love. Oh, you, you know him. You know? Uh, he's this way, he's that way, he's so hard to, to love. But that is not the point. The point that God is uh, giving us is you live the truth. And living the truth means you love the brethren. It is a command of God. You follow what God says. It is not just your own feelings, your own preferences, uh, your own hurts, but simply God. Focus on God and doing the will of God. Okay. So what else did Jesus come from? For? But Jesus, of course, is uh, Lord and Master. But he gave a different definition to being Lord and Master. And that is, he came to serve. Now, this is important for us because we, in turn, are Jesus' servants. So we need to understand what does it mean to be a servant, not according to the ways of the world. You know, there are households, they have their servants. There are, there are uh, em, uh, employees in a uh, corporation. You know, they, they, they are all servants. They are there are people who are in authority over them and they should uh, obey if they want to keep their, their jobs. But Jesus gives this a, a whole new meaning. So uh, the fifth reason why Jesus came is to serve. In Matthew 20, verse 28, just so the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Now, Jesus said this when the apostles were just in positions at his right and at his left. And Jesus told them, uh, this is not the way it should be with you. The first is us, the last is first. The ones who do us to be great is to be the least of all. And then he says, okay, I, I myself, son of man, came not to be served, but to serve. And to give his life as a ransom for the many. It is not just any service, it is the ultimate service giving his very life for us <coughs> as a, a, a ransom for the many. You know, you know what a ransom means. Some, someone is abducted, and so you, you bring a ransom to free that person. And the ransom, whether it's the money, is in exchange for that captive. So Jesus is a ransom for us because we were sinners. Uh, he saved us by his sacrifice on the cross, but he himself is the ransom. Uh, he himself is the one who paid the price. He himself is the substitute you know, uh, for us in the condemnation of our sins. He stood condemned and, and went to, to the, the, the cross. Okay, so Jesus serves us and calls on us to serve others. And because he gave his very life, we offer our very lives as well. Service is supposed to be selfless. You, you give your, your all. Now, this is important to say, again, because uh, even in the church, when you talk of uh, leadership, it's the one with authority, with power, it's the one who is being served. Well, servanthood, so we talk of servant leadership, but it's really servanthood, uh, are those who don't look to power to perks to find you know, as many even in the church do. That's why that's why um, uh, in, in many different ways our church is so troubled because those who are uh, the, the leaders who are in authority are those who are lording it over people. They're not serving in the way that Jesus but what Jesus did he took the lowest place and he says if, if uh, uh, you are uh, uh, the, the, the leader, the leader is the greatest, you take the lowest place. And Jesus literally did that. At the Last Supper, he washed the feet of the disciples. In order to wash the feet of the disciples, he had to, they were sitting down and he had to go down on, on his knees uh, 
and to wash the feet of the disciples. He literally took the lowest. So we too are called to serve. And the most important service, as we keep saying over and over, is the work of evangelization and mission. Why? Because it is through that work that the salvation won by Jesus on the cross is imparted to people, is experienced by people. And they will uh, attain to the fullness of abundant life, which is to make it to, to heaven. So that's the most important service for us. And we continue uh, to do that. It's carrying on the very work of Jesus, the very reason why he came into the world. Okay, moving on. So the basic service is evangelization. And, you know, one, one basic uh, fruit of evangelization is peace. Peace is shalom. It is being in right relationship with everyone else. You know? uh, if we take on, if we understand the gospel, the good news of salvation in Jesus, then we will enter into peace. Peace with God, peace within ourselves, peace with others, uh, peace in the world, and we will be agents of peace as, as well. Now, Jesus, when he appeared to the apostles after his resurrection uh, in the Gospel of John, what was the first thing he said in John 20? He said, peace be with you. So he, he knew that they were troubled. He knew that they were uh, sad. They were uh, even terrified of the authorities. Uh, they were lost. Uh, they weren't sure what, what it is that they were to do. You know? And so he said, peace be with you. I am here. I am alive. I have risen. I bring you peace. And then in John 20, verse 21, he says it again, but he adds something to it. So, so here, here he says, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. It is peace. I give you peace. I am peace. Have peace in your hearts. But then he says, as the Father has sent me, and I am the Prince of Peace, as I brought peace into the world, then so I send you. So you, as instruments of salvation, as agents of the gospel, as witnesses, as ambassadors of Christ, you are to bring peace as well. And this is so sorely needed. Everyone is looking for, 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 for peace. You know? Except that they don't understand and they don't know how to attain to, to peace. You can only attain to peace in Christ. You can only be in right relationship with others if you are being transformed in Christ. And we see that the world all around us is in strife. Throughout the history of the world, almost all years, except maybe for, I don't know, uh, 30, 40 years, there were wars in, in the world. And today there are so many wars uh, in the world. And let's even go with, with the uh, most basic relationship, husband and wife, in marriage. That's why many marriages break up because uh, husband and wife fight with each other. And then in, in families, parents and children, siblings among themselves, you know, uh, uh, relatives, and, and uh, this, this happens. And of course, uh, nations that war against each other. And then what we are seeing today are citizens within the same nation warring with each other. Civil strife, civil war, you know, insurrections. So this, these are the things. So we, have, we, we live in a world that is in strife, that is not experiencing uh, peace. So we, we need to preach the gospel, which is the gospel of peace. Lead people to Christ, and in living Christ, they experience peace, and they become agents of peace. The United Nations cannot do this. And I'll give you one, one basic reason. Because the United Nations today, and it's been for, for some time now, is deeply engaged in promoting the culture of death. It's supposed to help bring peace in the world. It's supposed to help uh, the poor. 
especially in the developing nations. But at the core of what the United Nations uh, is doing today is promoting uh, contraception, abortion, uh, homosexuality, uh, LGBT. This, this is so unfortunate. And how can this bring peace? You war on the unborn child? No. You war on the very design of, of God? You war against marriage and family life? You uh, war against uh, there being just two sexes? You're promoting all of this, the culture of death? How can you be instruments of peace? It cannot happen. It can only happen in Jesus. And so our church needs to get on with a massive evangelization, evangelization mode to get back on track with mission. And unfortunately, our church today is not on missionary mode. That's the very reason for being, why the church exists, why God, uh, why Jesus established his church to proclaim the gospel of salvation, to do mission. But we're doing so many different things today, but not mission, not the proclamation of the gospel of salvation in Jesus. We need to get back to that. The whole church needs to get back to that. And, and uh, the whole church, all of us Christians are sent by Jesus. Jesus preached uh, peace. We too are to preach uh, peace. The, 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 the verse uh, for that, uh, Jesus uh, preaching peace is Ephesians 2 verse 17. He came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. So this is important. Prince of Peace. We need to, need to preach the, the peace of, of Christ. Okay. So, Jesus came and uh, sends us forth. He, he did his work and then he sends us forth to do that same work. And this is crucial work for peace in the world, for the truth of God, for uh, well-being, for a life in uh, abundance. And Jesus himself, he came to ignite the world, to set the world on fire. And it is the seventh thing that he came to do. In Luke 12, verse 49, Jesus says, I have come to set the earth on fire. And how I wish it will already be uh, blazing. That fire of the Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus. And Jesus says, how I wish the earth, the whole world, uh, was already blazing with this fire of the, the, the Spirit. Now, it's uh, very interesting uh, what, what Jesus uh, says uh, next, because he says that uh, I came to bring peace. And normally we talk of, uh, we think of peace, uh, that means uh, unity, that means getting along with each other, that means no strife, no division, and that, that kind of thing. But this is what Jesus then says in Luke 12, verse 51 and, and following. Do you think that I have come to establish peace on the earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. Here was Jesus saying, I, I wish that that fire was already blazing. But in, in desiring that, in uh, sending people off to go and help set uh, uh, that, that fire uh, ablaze, it is that to bring peace. Now, actually, Jesus came to bring peace. He is the Prince of Peace. And we've been speaking about that. But this is what he means. He says, rather, division. And he says, uh, out of uh, uh, five, uh, three against two and two against three, father against the son, son against the father, mother against the daughter, daughter against the mother, mother-in-law against the daughter-in-law, daughter-in-law against the mother-in-law, even the in-laws are, are, are involved. But these are family members, those who ought to be closest to one another, those who ought to love one another, those who... Uh, ought to live in peace. Uh, they might be living in the same 
uh, home or seeing each other every now and then. But Jesus says, no, uh, I have not come to establish peace on earth, but division. And what does, what does he mean? Well, people will accept the good news or reject the good news. People, uh, because they accept or reject, will either be for Jesus or whether they know it or not, will be against uh, Jesus. And we're seeing that today. You have uh, uh, gay ideology, gender ideology, and there are many young people who accept that. Uh, and the older people, their parents cannot accept that, and right there is strife in, 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 in the family, between parents and uh, children. So, uh, peace uh, happens only if we accept Christ. If there are those who don't accept Christ, there will be conflict, for sure. Because you're either for or against. He says, he who is with me is not, is, uh, not uh, against me. Who is against me is not with me. You're for or against. You cannot straddle the fence. You, you're either hot or, or cold, not, not lukewarm. You need to make a uh, de de decision. You know? And because people do decide against accepting the truth of Christ, the light of Christ, the commandments of, of Christ, then there will be conflict. Because those who do accept ought to stand fast and proclaim the truth and, and speak what is right and just and, 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 and good. So that is why there will be conflict. Now, of course, the decision is up to the person but as far as we're concerned, our task, our uh, duty is to proclaim. You proclaim the gospel, you pray, the, 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 the word of God touches the, the heart of a person and will make a, a big change in that person, but it's really up to that person himself. Now, in doing this work, given that there's so much darkness, and, and lies and in, in, the, in the world. Uh, we also need this kind of zeal, this desire that is in Jesus' heart, that uh, the, 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 there are already be set on fire, that that fire be, be blazing. So we need zeal to establish uh, the kingdom of God. Paul himself, when he was speaking about the, the gospel in 1 Corinthians 9 verse 16, he says, Woe to me! If I do not proclaim it, if I do not preach it, the gospel was something precious entrusted to him and entrusted to you and I, to all disciples, to all Christians. And, and Paul says, woe to me if I do not preach it. How can I contain that fire that is blazing in my heart? I need to speak it or I'm going to burst and, and no good thing will happen to me. So that ought to be the, the same zeal that we have to proclaim the gospel. And in that zeal, in that desire to follow the great commission of Christ, in, in our uh, desire to help bring uh, so many more into a new life in Christ, then, just like also Paul, he endured all hardships. We too uh, ought to be ready to endure uh, hardships. And there will be hardships because the enemy will oppose it. Then the whole world is under the dominion of the evil one. And so many wrong things are happening with all the worldly powers today, practically in all areas of, of, of society and even within the church, opposing authentic Christianity and the truth of the gospel. So if you proclaim it, and if you proclaim it zealously, uh, you will uh, be opposed, you will be oppressed, you will be persecuted, but be ready to endure. In fact, uh, this was the posture of Paul. He says in Romans 5, verses 3 to 5, We even boast of our afflictions, knowing that affliction produces endurance, and endurance proven character, and proven character hope, and hope does not disappoint. Because the love of God has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. 
The love of God has been poured out into our hearts. The Holy Spirit has been uh, given to us. We are filled with the Holy Spirit and that needs to be outpoured, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And uh, even if there are afflictions, we see that afflictions are part and parcel of uh, the work that God has given us. Jesus himself went and endured much affliction. He went to the cross. So he tells us to follow in his footsteps. It is the same thing. Oh. They hated him, they will hate us. They persecuted him, they will persecute us. But we boast of our afflictions because we see that this works for our good. When we embrace the cross, we follow in the footsteps of God. And then practically speaking, we see affliction causes endurance. We need endurance to last until the very end. And then endurance produces proven character. It builds up virtues in us. It strengthens our uh, Christian character. And then proven character produces hope. And we always have hope. We never lose hope. No matter what we are facing uh, in life, and, and it seems as if we're losing the war. We are losing the war, by the way. <laughs> in the end, we will be victorious, but uh, many will be lost in the process. But despite all of that, we have our hope because our hope is in, in Christ. So, all of these things are, are important. We look to the fruit of hardships and the cross. So, never give up. Just uh, persevere. Hebrews 12 verse 1 says, uh, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us rid ourselves of every burden and sin that clings to us and persevere in running the race that lies before us. Many saints have gone before us, many martyrs. You learn the history of the church, read uh, to the history of the church. And uh, know so many that have gone uh, before us, all, all admirable, all heroes of the faith. And, and many of them were ordinary people. They had a special calling, but you and I have a special calling as well. They were empowered by the Holy Spirit. You and I are empowered by the Holy Spirit as well. So we, we, we look to them. And, and uh, they are witnesses, just as we're supposed to be witnesses. So we get rid of, of, of sin and persevere in running the race. Never give up. Also, uh, as a way for us to endure hard, all the hardship, know that God is there for us. God is always there for us as long as we cling to him. As long as we remain obedient, as, we, as long as we, we repent of sin. God is always there for us. And God always has his assurance. Uh, I, well, one particular assurance he gave to uh, Joshua. Joshua was a successor of Moses and it was Joshua who brought the people of God into the promised land. And they were told to take the land Joshua led in that uh, endeavor. That's important because today the whole world is under the dominion of the evil one. And God is also telling us not take the land, you know, proclaim the gospel, recover the territory, build up the kingdom of God. So this, this is what God said to Joshua in Deuteronomy 31 verse 8. He said, it is the Lord who goes before you. He will be with you and will never fail you or forsake you. So do not fear or be dismayed. If the Lord is with us, and we've seen how God has acted throughout salvation history, and we probably have our own experiences, the experiences of our brethren who have testified or shared, we have a wonderful, amazing, awesome God who is a God of signs and wonders, a God of, of uh, miracles. So he's always there for us. He will never fail us. He will never forsake us. What are we to be afraid of? Never be afraid. And never be dismayed, even when things seem to be not going well. That's part of it. You know? That's to help us also build endurance. And then just to put our faith in, in, in God. So, like Joshua, our task is to take the land. So, we endure the hardships that come with holy warriors doing that. Then thirdly, uh, how to endure all the hardships. We look to eternity. In 2 Corinthians 4, verses 16 to 18, Therefore we are not discouraged. Rather, 
although our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this momentary light affliction is producing in us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to what is seen, but to, but to what is unseen, for what is seen is transitory, but what is unseen is eternal. Look to eternity. This is important. If you're always looking down at this life and seeing all the things that are wrong and all the disappointments we have, uh, you, you might subject yourself to discouragement and, and even giving up. There are those who have given up. But you look to eternity. You look to what is to, to, to come. And, and we, we need to see that eternal glory that is awaiting us. We look not just to what is seen, seen with our eyes, but what is unseen, but we can see with our spiritual eyes. And that is the uh, eternal. So we, we do all of these things, we endure all hardships, uh, we can uh, help set uh, the earth on fire as, as Jesus uh, wanted, desired. So, brothers and sisters, it's important to have the eternal perspective, knowing that in the end, there will be judgment, salvation or condemnation. It's important to know. Because that's the difference between uh, e eternal bliss of heaven and the eternal fires of hell. So, so it is to come. And this is the uh, last uh, one that we look at, the, the eighth uh, aspect, reason why Jesus came, and that is to bring judgment. In John 9 verse 39, Jesus says, I came into this world for judgment, so that those who do not see my see." And those who see might become blind. Jesus will judge all of us at the end of time, how we have lived our life. And that is the time Jesus will separate the sheep from the goats. The sheep on the right of the eternal life, the goats on the left of the uh, eternal damnation. So God will judge the world, but we, you and I, all, we will be judged as, as well. And I guess it's especially so because we are privileged to serve. And, and where much is given, much is expected. Much has been given to you and I as we live our lives in community. God has revealed himself to us. We have a support environment. We have a lot of formation. We have the uh, avenues by which we can use the gifts given us by the Holy Spirit. You know? We have a clear vision and mission. We're called to be holy warriors. We go forth. So all of this is, is, is clear. You know? And this is the way by which we serve. And so much has been given, much will be uh, required of us. Uh, Jesus says this in Luke 12 verse 48. He says, much will be required of the person entrusted with much. And still more will be demanded of the person entrusted with more. God has given us so much, brothers and sisters, and we take responsibility uh, for that. It's a great privilege for us to serve, uh, but we will also have to face uh, the judgment of God as to how we made use of the gifts and everything that has been provided to us, including as a community. So uh, we have gifts. You, you make use of this. And what we hope at the end of time, at the judgment day, is uh, what we will hear from uh, Jesus as he said to the uh, servants who invested what the master <coughs> had entrusted to them. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 25 verse 21, Well done, my good and faithful servant. Since you were faithful in small matters, I will give you great responsibilities. Come, share your master's joy. What sweet words. At the end of time, let us just desire to hear those words from our master. Our master who is God. Our master who is Lord, who is creator. 
and and what great joy when we hear those words from him we struggled through life we had difficulties we had setbacks we sin we by the grace of god we bounce back we endured and then at the end just to hear our lord say those sweet words well done good and faithful servant enter into your master's joy okay brothers and sisters and so jesus came to bring us new life abundant life and that starts with conversion we repent of sin and we turn to faith in jesus then as we do so we begin to grow in the light of christ and the truth of uh, christ then it's not just us taking all of these good things that come from god but we also serve we also give and especially in the whole area of evangelization when we evangelize we're ambassadors of christ we're witnesses we're instruments of salvation we are instruments of god's very own peace his uh, shalom we help bring peace uh, to people and to the world so this is of crucial importance this is what we are called to do and so we are also called to give our all to god we follow in the very footsteps of jesus who came into the world and who gave his all so brothers and sisters jesus came and we know jesus will come again let's continue to understand why he came into the world and let us live out everything that we learn from that understanding amen <laughs>